which is um, entitled you know, The Portuguese Revolution and Soviet Intervention in Angola. Um, I want to start with, first of all, just looking at some of the big themes that I look at uh, in my uh, forthcoming book um, called The Liberation. So just uh, to put it very, very broadly, uh, this book looks at Soviet relations with the kind of dominant um, liberation movements and anti-colonial movements, the MPLA in Angola, Freelium Mozambique, and Paegisi in Guinea-Bissau during the period of um, the colonial wars from 1961 to 1974. And very broadly, um, it's uh, the book and I sort of reinstates the role of African leaders in the process of decolonization, the African elites um, in, this, in this time, and kind of look at their agency and their role in the process of um, decolonization. But I also look on the Soviet side, I also reinstate the role of Soviet uh, middle ranking officials, as I call. So the people working in different uh, different bureaucracies, especially the International Department of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, and how kind of their relationships, their preferences uh, shaped this relationship between the Soviet Union on one hand and the liberation movements on the other hand. And finally, in this book, I reinterpret uh, the Soviet involvement in the um, Angolan Civil War, especially the very early stage of that involvement from uh, 1974 to 1975. So actually, and this will be the focus on, of my talk, and when I started off this uh, project very, very long time ago, actually now, this was my original aim, right? My original aim was to understand uh, you know, so I was talking about this some time ago and for some time now, why the Soviet Union became involved in um, the Angolan Civil War on, um, on behalf of the MPLA, came to support the MPLA and started giving obviously, um, assistance to MPLA in 1974-75. So kind of this, this original aim of my, of my research project, which of course, then became a much broader project looking at Soviet Cold War in Africa more general. But this was the original aim of, of this book project. And this is the specifically the chapter that I will focus on in this talk. So just to give you a very, very broad overview, right? Um, there are three main kind of works that have looked at Soviet relationship with the MPLA and the liberation movements in this particular moment um, after the revolution of 74, 75, you know, kind of very, very broadly, right? So I'm not gonna, uh, I'm not talking about a lot of the books that um, covered this period before the archives were opened, but these are the kind of three main books, main three, three main authors who have looked at the specific episode of Soviet involvement in Angola. So that is um, Od Arnevestad's The Global Cold War, uh, Pierre Glegesius' Conflicting Missions, and also Vladimir Shubin's um, The Hot um, Cold War. So in, again, very broadly, um, Vestad and Glegesius, they have uh, sort of disagreed about the buildup of Cuban troops um, in Angola in 1975. And this debate, you know, as to how and when Cuban troops became involved in Angola was never fully resolved. And was never fully resolved because uh, these two historians relied on different sets of archival material, one on the Soviet and another on uh, the Cuban. And since uh, the Soviet material Soviet archival documents were closed for a very long time, since the 1990s, um, this um, debate could never be fully resolved. But what happened in the past five years is that Russian archives um, and a lot of documents 
pertaining to this period have become available to researchers. So um, this, this, this debate now can be resolved and now we can actually understand uh, exactly kind of the Soviet thinking at the time, how they understood uh, that conflict um, and, uh, and what they were thinking about, about the events in Angola in 1974-75, because the documents are now available. The third author I want to mention is Vladimir Shubin's The Hot Cold War. And uh, Shubin was somebody who was involved, who was actually himself part of the uh, Soviet government at the time, was a member of the Soviet Solidarity Committee. And partly based on a lot of his notes, um, he also kind of provides an additional account of Soviet thinking at the time, especially highlighting the role of kind of men on the ground from the Soviet side. Um, so I think whom he kind of calls unsung heroes of the story. So of course, you know, it's, it's clear that uh, he, he has a political kind of political stance to an extent, but still nonetheless, um, it's a valuable addition to these two. So I would say, you know, these are really still really useful resources, but um, all of them don't fully address how developments in Portugal at the time fitted within the broader story of how the Soviets understood developments in Angola as well. And hopefully I can, this is where I can um, come in uh, with this new, new documents that have been recently declassified. So, very broadly, uh, my talk uh, will, will be uh, divided into kind of five main parts. So first of all, I'll talk about how the Soviets understood uh, the coup in Portugal, of course, followed by the Croatian Revolution, how they understood these events, and what role, if any, they played in the negotiations for independence, independence of Guinea-Bissau and Mozambique. Uh, in, um, in May to, to September of 1974. Uh, the, uh, the parts two to four, I will look at the Angolan part of the story more specifically. So going chronologically, so, but hopefully I will not bore you with too many details of chronological events because the story is quite complex, but I'll explain to you how Soviet thinking about events in Angola unfolded and evolved based on uh, this new narrative I have reconstructed. And finally, I will make um, some conclusions. So to start off, it is really important to remember that uh, the coup in Lisbon um, in April 1974 was originally received with much optimism but also with a lot of uncertainty and anxiety on behalf of leaders of the nationalist movements uh, in the colonies. So these, the, uh, the leaders of the nationalist movements were particularly concerned once the coup in Portugal uh, took place about the role of General Spinola, General Spinola, who was famously um, the governor general in Guinea-Bissau and who was appointed the president um, of the Republic by the members of the armed forces movement, a movement of the forces armadas uh, who um, were in charge of the coup in April, 1974. So there's a lot of optimism, but a lot of anxiety, especially in the colonies as to how uh, events would pan out, whether the changes that took place are kind of real changes and would lead to independence or whether they would not, right? So this is a very important context to understand um, developments after that. And indeed, um, Spindler's plan, as many Portuguese researchers have, uh, have uncovered it, is that he hoped that um, uh, there would be, um, there would ensure kind of some kind of Portugal will retain some kind of close connection with the colonies, especially, um, especially to Angola. In uh, May 1974, 
the first Portuguese uh, provisional government started negotiations for transitions to independence in Guinea-Bissau, led by Foreign Minister Mario Soares on behalf of the first provisional government and Pedro Pires on behalf of the PAEGC, uh, the Party for Independence of um, Guinea-Bissau and Cape Verde. Spinola also had an important role in this process though. Uh, in particular, uh, initially he insisted that there should be referendums in Guinea-Bissau and other colonies um, on the status um, of the relationship between, uh, between the colonies um, and Portugal, and that there should be no kind of recognition um, this straight away uh, of self-determination for Cape Verde, right? Um, so at least this is what uh, the PAEGC was communicating to Moscow, that this is, this is the kind of tensions that were going on uh, between the two sides, uh, uh, the PAEGC and Mario Soares during talks in, in London. So because of these tensions that the PAEGC was communicating to Moscow, uh, the um, negotiations originally between the Portuguese government um, and the PAEGC broke down uh, fairly, fairly quickly. What's really interesting is that in talks with uh, President, US President uh, Richard Nixon in the Azores, um, Spinola argued that it was Moscow, it was the Soviet Union who were responsible for the breakdown of talks with the PAEGC, right? So I'm talking now uh, June, uh, July, uh, June, May, June, 1974. So Spinola argues to Nixon that the Soviets were responsible for the breakdown down of talks. So as I've discovered uh, in the archives from the archives, um, you know, this was definitely um, not the case. So how did the Soviets react to revolution in Portugal, right? So what, how, what was their reaction to these events? Uh, to the coup and to revolution that unfolded um, quite dramatically um, on the streets of Lisbon and other cities in the country more broadly. So the reaction was actually two-sided. Two there were two sides to it. Uh, on one hand, from the Soviet perspective, uh, the Carnation Revolution offered the prospects of revolutionary transformation in Portugal. Right? So I'm talking from the Soviet perspective. Again, fundamentally, the Soviets held high hopes for the prospects, for the political prospects of the Portuguese Communist Party, uh, who had dominated uh, the underground resistance against the dictatorship, um, of course, and who acquired many followers among the professional middle class, the army and the working class. And as one senior cadre in the international department of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union argued, his name was Anatoly Chernyaev, uh, Kunyal's, Alvaro Kunyal's return to Lisbon, you know, this kind of very dramatic return to Lisbon that I'm sure many of you know about, could be compared to Vladimir Lenin's arrival to Petrograd in April 1917, right? So it's a kind of, he compares that event in his, in his diary. So of course, you know, it, on, in this picture, you can see Mario Soares and Alvar Cunyal, kind of in a very dramatic portrayal of them in a tank during this kind of May Labor Day uh, parade demonstration um, in Lisbon. So on one hand, there's a lot of optimism about the prospects of kind of revolutionary transformation, especially since Alvaro Cunhal enters the first provisional government in Portugal. On the other hand though, uh, the Portuguese Communist Party at that point remained really insecure, uh, fearing kind of a right-wing counter coup in Portugal at that point. 
So as a member of the first provisional government, uh, Kunyal adopted sort of moderate position. That he wanted to work within the government, kind of this, uh, this alliance in a way he made with uh, Mari Soares. And what I have discovered in the archives, and which was really interesting to me, is that almost intuitively, but now we know, is the Soviets um, actually followed the agendas of the Portuguese communists, right, of Alvaro Cunhal. And their decisions and their moves uh, early on in this process aimed to reinforce Cunhal's position in the government, right? So they wanted to strengthen, to help Cunhal in the government. As a result, and this is an important point. As a result, that precluded the Soviets from putting excessive pressure on Lisbon over the process of transition in the colonies, right? So they wanted to help Cunhal and Portuguese communists. That's why they um, did not put much pressure on the Portuguese negotiators over the process of the nature of transition, the speed of the transition, so on. So I will, uh, I will give you one example, and it's, it's an important uh, example. So the matter of Soviet uh, recognition of the first prov provisional government provides a good illustration to this point. As I've discovered in the documents, the Portuguese communists, the Portuguese Communist Party, first advised the Soviet government to withhold recognition of the first provisional government until substantial process on negotiation, right? Negotiation on decolonization could be made, right? So to keep up the pressure on, on the first provisional government on Lisbon. But then the Portuguese Communist Party changed the advice, at least that's what we see from the documents. They changed the advice and say, uh, and they went to Moscow and said, go ahead and go forward with the recognition of uh, extending diplomatic recognition. So um, the Soviets then went ahead and granted official diplomatic recognition of Portugal on 10th of June, right? So of course, you know, there might be other kind of um, uh, other broader um, reasons why they went ahead and, and did it quite quickly, but from the documents, it seems that the role of the Portuguese communists was important, that they first advised to withhold recognition, and then they actually advised to go ahead with it in order to support their own position within the government. So I thought that was, that was, that was very interesting. And of course, as a result, right, the leaders of the African liberation movements were very unhappy with that decision uh, since their strategy was to put pressure on Lisbon and deny recognition. Um, kind of deny recognition to, uh, to Portugal um, until substantial progress was made on the transition, on the quick transfer of power, right? The strategy of kind of putting pressure on Lisbon and withholding recognition was also supported by the Organization of African uh, un Unity, right? So uh, for example, the leaders of the Mozambican Frelimo were particularly angry with the Soviets that they went ahead and extended recognition to Portugal and without consulting them and in the midst of this kind of very tense negotiation process when the talks with the PAGC had just broken down so kind of this is uh, you know 10th of June right 10th of June uh, 1974 so they were quite unhappy with it and there was a quite a bit of a tense and dramatic moment uh, with Soviet officials coming uh, to Dar es Salaam and having very kind of angry exchanges with Samara Michelle, 
about this issue, right? Once again, uh, some more quite angry that uh, the Soviets seem to be prior to prioritizing the agendas of the Portuguese Communist Party and not of Frelimo of the liberation movements. So um, in the end, um, as I'm sure uh, most of you know in this audience, uh, the process of negotiations um, speeded up um, after uh, Colonel Vasco dos Santos Goncalves, um, a key figure in the armed forces movement, became the new prime minister. And these changes um, paved the way for quick agreements and quick transfers of power um, to Frelimo in Mozambique, because a period of transition was negotiated there, and the direct transfer um, to PAEGSA in Guinea-Bissau. But just to summarize my point is that from the start, uh, the Soviets seem to kind of prioritize agendas uh, of the Portuguese Communist Party um, in this process of the colonization transition. So um, I would say that um, uh, Spinola wasn't, wasn't right to say that the Soviets uh, tried to put a block on this process. They actually wanted to help the Portuguese communists who worked within the government at that point in time. So moving on to um, what happened, um, what happens in Angola at this point, of course, the situation there, as you may know, was much more complicated uh, because the nationalist movement there was split between three competing organizations, uh, the MPLA, the FNLA, and UNITA, and each of them had their own regional and eventually international uh, backers and allies as well. Uh, for example, Holden Roberto's uh, FNLA received support from uh, Joseph Mabuto in Zaire, and um, Zambia's uh, President Kenneth Kaunda favored UNITA and Jonas Savimbi. Meanwhile, uh, the junior military officers, um, the armed forces movement who took power in Lisbon, favored um, Agostino Neto's MPLA. And uh, Neto himself had, of course, long-standing links uh, with the Portuguese Communist Party. And we can discuss, this, discuss that as well in the Q&A. So what I've discovered in the documents is that after revolution, uh, after the coup um, in Portugal in 1974, and as the revolution unfolds in Portugal, Neto, Agostino Neto, who you see, of course, him here in this photograph, the leader of the MPLA, he sought to leverage his links with the Movimento of Forces Armadas, with the Armed Forces Movement, to seek military assistance, military support from the Soviet Union. You might be surprised uh, to wonder, you know, the Soviet Union was supporting the MPLA uh, throughout this process, right? So why the need to seek assistance from the Soviet Union? Why was this necessary? Actually, um, at that point uh, in uh, April 1974, Soviet relations with Agostinho Neto uh, were at the lowest point uh, they had been since um, the early 60s. At this point, the MPLA, the Movement um, Liberation of Angola, was split with uh, rival factions uh, vying for power. And uh, as a result, just before revolution, uh, the coup in Portugal, the Soviets had actually terminated assistance to the MPLA because of the internal disagreements within the MPLA. So at the point of April 1974, no aid, no military aid is coming to the MPLA from the Soviets at all, right? So there's no aid really to the MPLA, no military assistance to the MPLA at this point in 1974. 
So of course, from NATO's perspective, it's really important. It's in fact crucial in this, uh, this, this environment where there's increasing competition between these three movements to re reinstate Soviet support and including Soviet military assistance. So it's, it's very, very crucial. So he, he, he looks for it in a lot of places uh, from the socialist countries of Eastern Europe, the GDR, Yugoslavia is very important, but of course he also wants for the Soviet Union to reinstate the military support um, to the MPLA. So um, how does uh, NATO uh, go ahead um, and do that? So in the course of 1974, NATO continuously approaches the Soviets via you know, con conversations with ambassadors in Dar es Salaam, in Brazzaville, in Lusaka, um, arguing that uh, the armed forces movement right, saw him, NATO, as the chief negotiator on behalf of the liberation movements. So, and he argues as well that um, he needed Soviet military assistance to counter uh, his chief rival, um, Holden Roberto of the FNLA, who had substantial support from Zaire and the United States. So we of course already know, um, already know a little bit about those, the, those kind of links between the MF, uh, the armed forces movement and uh, the MPLA, but the newly released documents, um, news, uh, Soviet documents revealed that NATO actually claimed um, to have struck a secret deal uh, with the armed forces movement, with the MFA that guaranteed him wide-ranging Portuguese support on the ground in Angola during the transition period. So I'm talking here about September, October of 1974, so before the Alvar Accord. So in, for example, in one telling exchange between NATO and the Soviet ambassador to Dar es Salaam, NATO claimed that uh, the Portuguese key negotiator, Major uh, Melon Tunis, fully supported the MPLA because behind the chief rival, the FNLA, stood um, Mobutu and the United States, who, I quote, um, were attracted to the smell of Angolan oil. So basically, NATO is trying to uh, to show, to tell the Soviets that the Portuguese negotiators, they were really favoring the MPLA because they wanted to keep influence um, in Angola. And if um, FNLA came to power, basically United States would replace, uh, would replace Portugal and you know, that, that wouldn't be good. So um, there is, NATO is basically leveraging uh, leveraging what he claims as kind of this very close connection he has to the Portuguese, you know, armed forces movement, uh, to tell the Soviets, you know, support me because I have I have the support um, of the Portuguese, basically, uh, for the Portuguese in this. So, for example, you know. In addition, he claims that the Portuguese agreed to hand over access to military airfields, roads, and army vehicles in Angola to the MPLA. So this is kind of what he claims. So uh, to the Soviets, I'm not saying this was exactly how it happened, but this is what he claims. That's how he sells, you know, this to to the Soviets, right? So by the end of 1974. Um, the Soviets decide, the Soviets decided to restore military assistance to uh, NATO's MPLA since they basically bought uh, NATO's version of events, right? So by the end of 1974, they decide to restore military assistance to the MPLA. Of course, and we can speak a little bit more about this in the Q&A, uh, the Soviets didn't rely only on NATO, but they also sent some observers, kind of 
some military men, a few journalists uh, to Luanda, to kind of to confirm this version of events. They spoke to um, Rosa Coutinho, also confirmed that they supported the MPLA, but that the FNLA, the chief rival was getting more and more powerful in Luanda. So it kind of they sent also men on the ground to kind of confirm this uh, version of events. Um, and Moscow basically decided to restore military support to the MPLA, basically as a defensive measure to fortify the MPLA in case of a military showdown with the FNLA, right? So they decided to restore this military support um, kind of from a kind of defensive, uh, in case there will be a military uh, showdown between the MPLA and the FNLA in Luanda. But, and this is a, a very interesting and important point, um, the, at this point, you know, January 1975, um, the MPLA and the Soviets still believed the transition to independence in Angola could still be peaceful. But of course, you know, this, this perception uh, would uh, change in the course of the following uh, months. So um, kind of that leads me to the, to the uh, next uh, part, uh, part of my talk. And this is of course what happens uh, from the point of the Alvar Accord and towards the end then the, of the year. So as I'm sure all of you know, on January 15th, um, the Portuguese government and the leaders of the nationalist movements signed the Alvar Agreement outlining the transition to independence in Angola. The parties agreed on the terms of the power sharing agreement and set a date for um, the jury independence and the withdrawal of Portuguese troops on November um, 11th, 1975. The agreement provided for power sharing, but it was somewhat problematic in other ways, since as some would suggest, it didn't limit the number of troops that each liberation movement was allowed to have to maintain outside the joint military force that was set up at this point as well. So here in this um, photograph, you can see some of the uh, participants in the negotiations, some of the signatories of um, the Alvar Accord, of course, uh, Admiral Rosa Coutinho, new governor general in Angola, Agostino Neto, uh, Francisco de Costa Gomes, Holden Roberto, famously with the sunglasses, um, Jonas Wimby, um, Jonas Wimby, and, um, and Mari Soares. So um, the agreement uh, was signed, but peace uh, proved elusive uh, because, um, you know, as uh, the year unfold unfolded, uh, there were significant clashes um, in the capital of Luanda between the followers um, of the MPLA and the FNLA and also um, a little bit UNITA. Overall, uh, the MPLA was generally popular in Luanda, but the FNLA had many more men who were armed and equipped uh, by uh, the Zairians. Uh, the competition um, between the rival nationalist movements, who were now legal, of course, um, um, and who could set up their offices in Luanda, uh, intensified after Agostinho Neto returned to Luanda, kind of to kind of a hero's welcome um, there. Still, you know, and to reiterate this point, you know, it's kind of, kind of show what were the connections between how the Soviets understood the situation in Portugal and Angola. The Soviets believed at this point um, that despite these clashes on the streets of Luanda, the Portuguese troops uh, would still guarantee a relatively peaceful transition, um, at least up until independence on the 11th of November, right? So even though there are clashes in Luanda and increasingly people who are coming to Luanda, they kind of experience this, this very tense atmosphere um, we're kind of shooting on the streets, um, they still believe that the Portuguese troops 
uh, would ensure a relatively peaceful transition, at least until up until independence. But and this is a really interesting, I think what I've, what I've found is that there came a turning point to this for the Soviets. Uh, their calculations of the nature of the transition and how peaceful it could be uh, changed around the 1st of May, 1975, when the group of Soviet officials um, came to Landa to participate in the celebrations of May Day. Again, another May Day um, celebrations uh, on 1st of May, 1975. So what they saw when they, um, when they kind of arrived in Luanda in May, around the 1st of May, 1975, is a kind of dramatic escalation of violence on the streets um, of Luanda. One of, one of them was a man called Pyotr Yevsikov, who was a key, kind, key officer uh, responsible in the international department for uh, the for relations with the MPLA, Freely Muay GC. So he was part of that delegation too, and he describes kind of them descending on the plane in Luanda, and all the lights were off, um, and uh, there was kind of shooting there, and he kind of describes that kind of very tense atmosphere. So uh, the Soviet officials who came to Luanda at this point, and they, they went, they talked to NATO, they went back, back to Moscow, they were quite taken aback by what they saw, by the violence. And what they realized is that Portuguese army was not able or willing uh, to ensure a peaceful transition in Angola at this point. So as I argue, uh, after that turning point in May 1975, the Soviets really ramped up military assistance to the MPLA, uh, which would uh, arrive by ship uh, via the point via the port of point, port of Point Noir in Congo Brazzaville. So there's this kind of turning point moment that the Portuguese, as the Soviets realized, would not be not willing or not able to ensure a peaceful transition in Angola. So overall, by June 1975 the Soviets had come to believe that events in Angola were part of what they call a international conspiracy, right? So the kind of conspiratorial, conspiratorial kind of language that they're using, that what's happening in Angola, right? The FNLA kind of attacking the MPLA was backed by the United States and that they need to um, increase support to the MPLA to avoid what they call a Congolese scenario, right? Of course, what they're referring to is the murder of Patrice Lumumba in 1961. So they're kind of saying, we need to increase support to the MPLA or our friends, the MPLA would be beaten and there would be a repetition of the Congolese scenario of um, 1961. Uh, so, but what's interesting is that at this point, you know, um, in kind of June, 1975, the, the United States wasn't fully as directly involved uh, on behalf of the FNLA. That came a little bit later. But already by this point, by May, June, the Soviets believed that the FNLA re were receiving very substantial support from Zaire, which was true, uh, but also from the United States, which wasn't fully true. At least they were not, uh, they were not uh, supplying the, the weapons and so on. They came, that came a month later. So there's, there's a little bit of this disconnect, right, between what the kind of uh, picture that the MPLA and NATO is portraying, that there's this international conspiracy against the MPLA and what's actually, what's actually happening on the ground. So uh, which shows that, of course, you know, kind of information flows really matter in the story and which information um, they're, they're getting there. So, um, now, um, the story, of course, here is, is uh, from, from about July to November in Angola's uh, descent um, into uh, a civil war, a full-blown civil war, and uh, becoming, as it's fashionable to say, a Cold War hotspot. 
So I, I won't provide uh, the full details of um, Angola's kind of descent in the civil war and internationalization of the Angolan civil war. But suffice to say that uh, by June, July 75, there were already significant clashes um, in Northern Angola between the MPLA and the FNLA. Initially, the MPLA seemed to have the upper hand uh, but um, by August, September, the FNLA was getting stronger, um, especially after the CIA launched Operation Ear Feature, uh, which involved um, airlifting weapons um, to Kinshasa uh, here uh, to resupply the Zairean army, which would then transfer weapons to Roberto's um, FNLA. So this story, you know, of the U.S. involvement uh, is very well recorded. Uh, you know, there's a lot of um, really good work um, by many many scholars on on that story. So it's very well known, and the motivations here are also well established. Um, again, another important point here in the story it comes in August '75 when uh, Cuba's leader Fidel Castro sent in advisors to the MPLA, right? Upon request of the MPLA. And finally, uh, to cut you know, a complicated story short, finally, um, in October, on October 14th, the South African uh, troops invaded um, Angola uh, to prevent basically the MPLA victory uh, in Angola, uh, they intervened on kind of on behalf of the FNLA and UNITA, who they were supporting. So very quickly after October uh, 14, the South African Defense Force uh, and the FNLA and UNITA uh, together, they overran major um, Angolan cities in southern Angola. So this is. And I'm showing kind of approximately how they were, how they were going from, um, uh, these are old names, so this is a map from how they were called at the time. Uh, they were going from the south here and towards the major cities um, on the Atlantic coast, and then towards uh, Benguela and Lobito, and towards the aim was um, to reach Luanda uh, before Independence Day. So this is a very, very rough approximation of, um, of, of that um, invasion route. So a major debate between Arne Westad and Pierre Gilles is, at this point was um, about um, the buildup of Cuban troops in this crucial month of October and November 1975. So basically, um, Westad puts the Cuban troops uh, fighting with um, the, FNL, the, the MPLA, of course, in Angola uh, to October, right? So kind of earlier to October, November. Um, and Glejesius um, puts it to November. So basically the new Russian archives uh, confirm Glejesius timeline on this, right? They confirm Pierre Glejesius timeline. So just to, to confirm that the Russian sources suggest uh, there were definitely no regular Cuban troops in Angola before November the 4th, uh, when Castro launched his Operation Carlota, which involved sending uh, special forces and then regular Cuban troops uh, to help MPLA um, defend Luanda from a kind of attack from the FNLA here, right? So it's only after November the 4th that uh, the Cubans sent regular Cuban troops. Uh, before that, there were only Cuban advisors who were engaged in, in some fighting with the MPLA Angola, but not um, uh, no regular Cuban troops. And um, I think as Bruno Reich has argued, um, of course, you know, the Cuban and Soviet support for the MPLA uh, would have been impossible without explicit approval um, from the Portuguese administration. I think I think that's definitely that's definitely true. So overall, what what do we learn from this story, right? I think overall, the Soviets and you know they they were quite clear about that. Um, they preferred so-called 
an African solution to the Angolan problem, uh, which meant, you know, not involving the, the Cuban troops. Uh, and they hoped that the Soviet trained um, MPLA forces uh, that were called, you know, the uh, FAPLA uh, would uh, be able to defend Luanda. They also relied um, and they hoped they relied on the support provided by the PIGC. Actually, they hoped the PIGC would come uh, to help to help the MPLA as well, uh, to stave off the South African troops at this point. Um, so to uh, kind of to, to cut the story short, uh, the Soviets um, didn't want the Cuban intervention. They preferred um, an African solution to the Angolan problem. And they were quite surprised when Castro, Fidel Castro, sent in regular troops. So kind of that, that time frame that um, Pierre Glejec has puts forward, you know, is definitely, it is definitely true. Um, but of course, uh, we also know a little bit more about the logistics of the Soviet operation. And I'm happy to discuss this in the Q and A, you know, some of the problems with the logistical, basically transferring weapons to the MPLA in Angola. Uh, we know a little bit more about this as well. Okay, so, so what are some of the main conclusions from this story, right? Big, big, or big or small uh, conclusions from the story. Of course, I don't think it comes as a surprise that uh, clearly the Portuguese revolution, you know, inadvertently destabilized even further kind of the situation in Angola because it increased rivalries between the nationalist movements um, as they anticipated a power struggle in the run up to independence. Uh, the Soviets first believed that the Portuguese troops uh, could ensure a peaceful transition, but they ramped up support to the MPLA when it became clear that this would not happen. Uh, the Soviets overall took a somewhat Portugal centric view of the colonization. Moscow, at least originally, relied on the PCP, the Portuguese Communist Party, and the left-wing members of the armed forces movement to push for rapid transfers of power in the colonies. And as seen from Moscow, um, events in the Portugal and the colonies were closely interlinked, closely, closely linked and they believed that strengthening the left wing within the provisional government uh, would endow it with greater power and result in success in the liberation moment. Right? So they believed by supporting the Portuguese communists and the left wing in the, in the government, uh, this would also lead to, to the solution um, um, in the colonies, uh, which of course, to an extent clashed with the agendas and um, of the liberation movements themselves, right? Who wanted to put pressure um, on, um, on Lisbon, on the, on the Portuguese government. Agostinho Neto, um, as we know now, alleged close relationship with the, uh, with the members of the MFA. And uh, this relationship, at least the way he uh, he portrayed it was even more important, I would say, than previously understood. Um, we already know that MFA favored the MPLA during the negotiations, but new documents show that kind of Neto um, harnessed his what he called unique relationship um, and this kind of clandestine agreements that he claimed to have had to convince the Soviets to resume military assistance to the MPLA. Um, so he also kind of perpetrated a sort of conspiratorial version of the events of Angola, um, arguing the FNLA was a puppet of Zaire and also United States, right? Which, which we can argue with this point, you know, but this is kind of what he wanted to portray, right? To the Soviets, that's the version of events he wanted to portray. And I think he did so quite successfully. Overall, of course, NATO's interpretation kind of global interpretation of events in Portugal and 
and Angola matched the Soviet's worldview. Uh, the Soviet decision to restart military assistance uh, was thus meant to kind of restore military parity between the MPLA and its rivals, uh, putting um, it in a position of dominance um, in, in Angola. Fundamentally, uh, Moscow uh, wanted a so-called African solution in Angola, nonetheless. Uh, they, uh, the Soviets rested their hopes on Soviet trained members uh, of the MPLA, the military, Soviet, uh, Soviet uh, Angolan MPLA trained in the Soviet Union, who could, they believe, could take charge of the defense of Luanda. And they preferred that MPLA's African allies, like the PIGC, could also kind of step in and support this effort rather than the Cubans. So again, you know, just to confirm what we already knew that it was Castro's initiative definitely to introduce regular Cuban troops, uh, mainly due to developments on the ground. Um, that's why Castro made, made this decision. So of course, you know, from then on, the story is quite familiar. I mean, with the support of Soviet weapons and Cuban troops, uh, the MPLA's armed wing, uh, the FAPLA, managed to hold on to Luanda and subsequently uh, roll back the South African invasion. And you know, by 1976, some would argue the, lands, the lines had been drawn uh, between the different uh, parties and the set of stage for kind of another round of violence um, that would last, of course, in Angola intermittently until the death of Jonas Savimbi B in, in 2002. Of course, I don't want to draw a direct parallel to what happened, to, kind of direct line to what happened in 1974-75, but of course, this was an important period uh, that ensured the internationalization of um, the Angolan, uh, local Angolan rivalries there. So, um, Long, long, long story, and I think I omitted quite a few details about the logistics of the Soviet uh, operation, and also relationship with some regional uh, regional actors like Congo Brazzaville, Congo. But I'm happy to answer your questions in the Q and A. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Shantali. That was uh, um, very interesting. Um, many new information at least for me uh actually i'm not a specialist in the in, in the specific area but um it really changed the uh the uh the narrative i had of the whole process so thanks for that um there are two ways for people to uh um uh, put questions you can either raise your hand in the system and then Pedro will happily open your microphone or, and the second way is just to, uh, to write uh, a quick question uh, in the chat box. And I actually think we already have one there. Uh, could you recall the PPT in the start I miss? I uh, don't really understand what... Presentation, you mean? Um, we will, the, we've re we're recording, so we will, the, the okay. PowerPoint will be able to be seen in, in, in the video when we post it up. Okay. So, anyway. Well, Pedro has an initial question. Yes, thank you. Sorry, I should have unmuted myself. Uh, Thank you very much, Natalia. That, that was really, really fascinating, and it does give a whole new perspective on, on this. And, and I think what you're bringing to us is exactly what we're looking for to broaden out the conversation about uh, the international, transnational linkages of what happens in Portugal, in Luanda, um, uh, and elsewhere around this time. Um, you mentioned that you might have something more to say about how Cuba is able to transfer so much material and men to to Angola at a relatively short notice and I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that because that's perhaps a a bit of a puzzle for me how how Cuba is able to do so on its own uh, or to what extent there is Soviet assistance uh, in di directly or indirectly in transferring the troops and material over to Luanda at the end of 75. 
Thank you, Pedro. And of course, you've just touched on another uh, major point of debate, right? Between uh, between uh, Western and Glaciers, and that involves exactly that question: At what point did the Soviets start supporting the Cuban airlift of um, the, the lift of Cuban troops to uh, to Luanda? And um, I really hoped for a definitive answer um, on that question um, in in the archives and. Uh, from, of course, better to say that not all Russian documents have been declassified. So, of course, there is still something, a lot of things that we won't know. And I couldn't find a definitive answer to that question, actually. So, it's, uh, I think that for when, when it started, of course, Operation Carlota, it seems to be the case that Glejeshes is right to say that the Cubans did this on their own. Right, operating their own small aircraft uh, and also sending troops by ship. And it's not, it's still not clear, we still don't know exactly the point, the point when the Soviets started flying basically the Cuban troops to Luanda. Um, Glejesha says January, February 1976. I have found some evidence to suggest this might have been a bit earlier, so around December, because basically the kind of the CIA is citing kind of the uh, the Soviet uh, large planes, right, uh, doing so, doing these journeys uh, before the end of the year. Um, but uh, this doesn't happen. Um, this doesn't happen in November. I don't. Um, I don't think because the Soviets are basically. Uh, they're surprised that this is even going on uh, because uh, literally a little bit the smoking gun for me came uh, from the archives, uh, the Soviet archives, but conversations between uh, the Soviet ambassador and Fidel Castro himself. So there's literally a point of three days, 4th, 5th and 6th of November where at some at certain point on the fourth, you know, Castro is complaining about a difficult situation in Angola and saying that we have a few kind of advisors fighting there. And then the next day he's basically saying we had already sent Cuban troops, right? So this is there in writing and this is a matter of, of days. So of course the, the documents do not uh, provide exactly the reaction of the Soviets, right? Uh, these documents are not full like that, but we know that obviously from other sources that they were very surprised, let's just say, to say the least, right? But it seems that, uh, you know, at least initial kind of Operation Carlota, right, they, that that's the, was the name for the airlift, uh, was not, uh, you know, as, as we know, was not made with, with knowledge of the Soviets. But, you know, we still don't know exactly the day, the month, uh, when the Soviets are starting supporting that airlift. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you, Pedro. I have two raised hands, uh, Raquel Ribeiro first and Ricardo Noronha second. So Raquel, good afternoon. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you so much, Natalia, for the talk. It was very interesting. And I really uh, want to ask a lot of questions, but I'll just start with one. Um, uh, I wonder if the archive, I mean, my field is obviously the Cuban side. So um, I wonder if the archive, um, sorry, I will preamble slightly. I'm, I'm glad you actually um, demonstrate that it was actually Castro's own accord to um, get involved in, in Angola uh, more, more in depth. Um, there are a lot of new things coming up, even in relation to Cuba and relationship with the Soviet Union, that in a way um, demonstrate how Cuba, always in this tension between being economically and militarily dependent on the Soviet Union, in particular uh, from the early 70s onwards, how Angola can or, 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 or did or did not play an essential role here in readjusting the relationship between Cuba and the Soviet Union. And I wonder if from the archives, even if you were just saying that there's not enough evidence yet in relation to precise details of the launching of Operación Carlota and the following months, at least the, until the truce that is 
uh, signed in early 76 or mid 76. And I wonder if there's any details about uh, the tensions that could have uh, existed already between uh, Castro and the Soviet Union. And by, by deciding to do that in their own accord, how, how does the Soviet Union in a way um, tries to react, react to that or even or not tries to punish Cuba in relation to other you know, ways that they have for bargaining in, in the island? If you have any evidence of that. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, the original evidence that we had, you know, before this declassification, right, was a lot from, um, from memoirs, right? So the memoirs is uh, the memoir literature that, you know, was available even you know, before my research or before any documents shows that basically the Soviets, they were very surprised and very unhappy with the Cuban decision to introduce troops, but then they, um, went ahead with it, right? And of course, started supporting uh, supporting the Cuban airlift. So, and actually uh, that, um, uh, that, that relationship was, um, you know, was quite, quite, stro quite strong, including on the ground, because, you know, from, again, from the memoirs of Soviet instructors and translators who went to Luanda at this point, they actually showed that the Cuban troops, for example, were feeding them, right? To the extent that you know the Soviet high command forgot to give their own men kind of enough provisions um, in, for for their trip to Luanda, so the Cubans were actually you know giving their rations to the local kind of contingent. No, I'm I'm talking very early period, literally before the end of '75, right? That of course changed later, um, but. Um, I think that you know um, it seems again uh, it seems that the Soviets actually they dominated the support for the MPLA in the early in the early half of the year right from January to say to August of 1975. But then then there was this very quick increase in Cuban involvement right. So that's also what I'm saying is that it wasn't. Uh, all Cubans, it was the Soviets who kind of provide military support to the MPLA. And then in August, come August 1975, you know, the Cubans kind of start to ramp up the involvement very quickly. Um, so um, I'm not sure I've fully um, answered your question. Um, and of course, the tensions existed, had existed between the Cubans and the Soviets when it comes to liberation movements even prior to that. So for example, when it comes to the case of the PAIGC in Guinea-Bissau, right? Especially around the, the time of the murder of Imelka Cabral and the reactions of the Cubans, there were a lot of tensions between the Soviets um, and uh, the, the Cubans um, as to the, kind of the military strategy because the Cubans were pushing the PAIGC quite a bit to kind of increase the intensity of the attacks and the Soviets were not very happy with it. So I think, of course, you know, you're right. There were tensions on uh, on the level of kind of what kind of advice are we giving or military strategy that had predated this event in 1975. And of course, as we know, there would be a lot of tensions on the military side in Angola later on as well. When it comes to politics, uh, I think that's 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 the main focus of your question. It doesn't seem there was a uh, substantial tension on the political side at this point. It seemed that uh, at least initially um, the Soviets kind of supported the Cuban initially, uh, you know, kind of intervention and uh, kind of went along with it. And of course, what we also don't know is Soviet plan for after independence in Angola, right? Because we know already that even before Operation Carlota, right? Even before that, the Soviets had ramped up military assistance to the MPLA, right? That they had already introduced advisors who were waiting in Congo, Brazil, right? So they were, they were waiting for the day of independence. So we don't know exactly what their plan was for after the 11th of November. But I think from the Soviet perspective, it was important for them to wait until that day, to wait, to, to, to not do anything before that official day of independence of the 11th of November. So again, 
um, I don't think we know fully exactly what they hope to do uh, and the extent of their support for the MPLA after independence. Um, my guess is that they were planning to, to ramp up uh, kind of their support, but um, obviously they were not thinking, I think, of, of you know, Cuban, in terms of Cuban troops. I think they were thinking in terms of increasing military assistance uh, to the MPLA, sending advisors and so on. Thank you, Natalia, and thank you, Raquel. Um, the next question comes from Ricardo Noronha. Uh, hello, Natalia. Thank you very much for the presentation, which was quite illuminating in some, a lot of aspects. I have two questions. Uh, one concerns this exchange of telegrams between NATO and the Soviet ambassador in Tanzania, uh, which kind of changes the whole order of things in, in terms of causality as far as uh, I know the history and the historical narrative of what happened in Angola. So usually uh, we are invited to believe that actually Agustin Neto had always been a man of the Soviets or, you know, somebody very, very well connected with the Soviet leadership and that it actually had been the left wing of the, of the armed forces movement under the inspiration, leadership, influence of the Communist Party to have supported NATO because the Soviet Union demanded them to do so or invited them to do so. And so what you have just told us completely changes the, the sequence of causality. Um, and so I think it's very groundbreaking as far as I, so I know. I'm curious about two things concerning this exchange. The first is the exact date, if there is any, uh, in which NATO uh, places his exchange with Melon Tunis. And this is, I think it's relevant because up until the end of September 1974, the armed forces movement didn't have a fully institutionalized role. It wasn't even clear uh, who was allowed to speak on behalf of it. Uh, and so, because if I understood correctly, the exchange with the Soviet ambassadors in early October, I'm curious whether it happened Melon Tunis spoke with NATO before or after 28 September, just to put it very bluntly. And uh, a second question concerning still this uh, aspect is how serious did the Soviets take it? Apparently, from what you said, they took it seriously enough because they decided to support the NPLA. But is there the possibility or was it considered that NATO was just bluffing or was it right away so he's telling the truth and this is how it is. So I'm curious because I think it's really important uh, and, and I thank you a lot for having brought that to our attention. The second question is a little bit more offside. I'm curious about the Soviet evaluation of how, how well prepared were the FAPLA and particularly the cadres, the military cadres of the NPLA formed in Angola to actually you know, defend Luanda, take back the country because uh, from what I read, again, I have a superficial knowledge of the matter, but I was, always had the impression that they were relatively unable to match the situation in the sense that they were facing a much better equipped, organized military force, particularly the FNLA. And how, how did the Soviets then evaluate, if you ever come across such information, the progression of the war? Were they surprised on the success of the FAPLA and the Cubans in drawing back both the FNLA and UNITA and the South Africans, which is a big military accomplishment, as far as I know, or was it something that they kind of thought it was only natural? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I mean, there are many you know, ex absolutely excellent questions uh, here. I hope I got them all uh, on paper. So um, uh, the Soviets had a very difficult, very complicated relationship with Agostinho Neto. Right. Oh, no, they did not like the guy, right? But especially when you're talking about the members of the international department. There were some people in the kind of KGB, you know, that quite liked NATO and supported him. And I think that's, that's important. But overall, the members of the international department did not like him, support him. And I think that kind of um, because for many, for many reasons, and they always kind of, they were quite keen to listen to those who criticized NATO within the MPLA, you know, throughout this, this period. And it's true that at certain important points, uh, Kunyal, he kind of provided sort of a 
protective shield a little bit over Neto, you know, saying that yes, you know, you know, please, you know, do not complete, you know, he is still he is still all right. But overall, you know, uh, of course, I, I would say, you know, they had an independent relationship with Neto and with, with others, right? So um, when it comes to these conversations, well, Neto had many different conversations with ambassadors and uh, not just many conversations with uh, Soviet ambassadors in Lusaka, in Dar es Salaam, in uh, Brazzaville. He was always talking to, to the ambassadors, even at the point the relationship was at the lowest point, right? So the Soviets never wanted to quite break off with NATO. He just wanted to kind of teach him a lesson to try to mend mend relationship with uh, people like Daniel Chipenda, right? And others within the MPLA. Um, and when the question of Melo Antunes, thank you, I didn't actually realize that the date is really important here, but as I remember, the, the conversations here is referring to is around December the 1st, right? So that's after, after those events you were mentioning that he's saying that, you know, we have this clandestine talks, clandestine agreements with Melo Antunes. Um, about about these developments around so it's later in the year, around around December, December um, the first. So how um, seriously did the Soviets take NATO's kind of version of events? I think to an extent they they believed it. I if you never uh, of you never see I've never seen any documents to, to suggest otherwise. At the same time, you know he was not the only source of information. Uh, they sent uh, a famous journalist, Alek Ignatiev, Soviet journalist, went to Landa on several occasions uh, during this time. They also had um, a GRU, military intelligence officer, who was basically in Luanda for most, uh, for most of 1975 there reporting. At the same time, I would say that most of the information he had was probably coming from, from the MPLA. So uh, from different, so they had other people so to kind of roughly confirm the version of events, especially when it came, when it came to this notion that um, the Melon, that Rosa Coutinho was basically supporting the MPLA on the ground. Uh, so it basically, the people who were sent by the Soviets to Luanda kind of confirmed roughly this version of events that NATO was, was trying uh, to portray. Um, so it's, and we don't know what other sources the Soviets had from within the movement to the more forces armadas, right? Uh, from the MFA, and I'm pretty sure that had other sources, but uh, we don't know exactly you know, uh, who they were and um, exactly that side of information is still unavailable, right? Because for example, the archive of the intelligence services, that's off, you can't look at that, you can't see that. So I'm pretty sure there are other um, bits and information that are not fully available to us. So I'm not trying to be cryptic here, but obviously, you know, we don't know everything. Um, so when it comes to the, this is a really excellent question. Uh, how well uh, do, uh, do I think that the Soviets uh, believe how well were the MPLA FAPLA, how well trained were they? I, I found that the Soviets held this really interesting belief um, in the value of military training. And they did believe really that those men who were trained, they were, main, they were only men, uh, men who were trained, had military training in the Soviet Union, uh, you could rely on them and that they were kind of loyal, not loyal, but friendly to the Soviet Union, right? So they always pushed um, for more people to be trained in the Soviet Union. Um, and they kind of really had this, almost, to an extent, a dualistic notion, belief that uh, men trained in the Soviet Union would be more friendly to the Soviet Union, would be well trained. So I think they did think that the FAPLA could uh, at least initially, uh, hold on to Luanda, right, uh, in th this kind of two-week period, right? Um, I don't know if they kind of, if their assessment changed after it was clear that the South African 
force was driving very quickly towards the capital, right? And to kind of crushing, crushing their resistance on their way. Um, it seemed that, uh, I don't know if um, that changed the assessment at the point or they thought it would still be, be possible. There was clear an attempt to increase, um, to supply heavy weaponry, right? To the um, FAPLA at this point. And they actually flew uh, the BM-21s, uh, uh, right? The kind of the Grad rockets um, directly, uh, directly uh, to, um, they flew them uh, to uh, Brazzaville, then to Point Noir very quickly, even though the, it, it was actually very difficult to do so because the airfield in, in Point Noir so these are very <laughs> a lot of details that uh, the airfield in Point Noir was very kind of was very small, but they increased kind of the military assistance. They tried to supply the FAPLA with heavy weapons that they believed was necessary uh, to counter this offensive from the FNLA. Um, so, but it's it's hard to know exactly how they if they believed you know whether whether FAPLA would be able to hold on to Lu Luanda. And it seemed, as I mentioned, that they hoped that PIGC would actually kind of give a helping hand, right, in this uh, in this kind of scenario. Um, so, but I I don't know if that kind of how the assessment changed. Uh, it was clear that Castro changed his assessment um, after the Cubans, uh, were, you know, basically the Cubans suffered um, first losses um, around, you know, at Katenge this kind of important point um, uh, in, um, I think it was in, in, early, in early November. So he ch clearly changed his assessment, right, of, um, of the situation in Angola and that what led, as we know now for sure, because I've seen this in the documents, he's kind of, he's telling the Soviet ambassador that, look, you know, the situation in, in Angola is very dire and he actually uses quite, interesting language to suggest that uh, FAPLA uh, are not up to the task there, that they're kind of dropping their weapons, right? That's, that's in the document. Uh, so uh, that's why we need to introduce Cuban troops, right? So he's definitely changing his assessment, uh, but I don't know uh, whether the Soviets were changing their assessments at this particular moment in time. Thank you, Natalia and Ricardo. Uh, we have another question from Rui Jacinto. Uh, is this microphone off? Uh, no. Hello, Rui. Thank you. Um, Thank you um, for your communication and your information about uh, Soviet archives, um, which is, and the chronology, uh, chronology uh, was particularly uh, important. Uh, uh, so I have uh, comments on, on this and two, two questions. Uh, first, um, you, you said that um, in 1974, uh, uh, relationship, relationship uh, between M M PLA and uh, uh, so Soviet Union were in uh, the lowest, lowest point. Um, I think uh, eventually um, Agustin Neto uh, relationship with the Soviet Union uh, were not so so um, so effective, uh, um, and uh, in 1973 uh, and 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 the first months of 1974. Um, uh, Soviet Union was was more um, uh, was more um, um, near uh, Shipenda's uh, uh, positions. Uh, what so, so called. Um, Eastern Front uh, of the M MPLA, uh, the colonial war, um, and this 
this uh, their ship and uh, then uh, goes to the revolta tiva uh, um, and 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 then uh, after independence uh, we know uh, soviet soviets um, uh, emphasize um, uh, on on um, Nitwalves and uh, other factions uh, of the N N N NPLA, and was Cuba uh, that in 1977 uh, uh, helped uh, NPLA um, on the coup of uh, 27th of May. So um, we I I, I can add. Can uh, question what what was really um, the information uh, of KGB and Soviets um, about military situation in Angola um, in in this crucial uh, moment uh, crucial phases of the summer of 1975 um, because by well, uh, Soviet were provided tra training uh, aid to NPLA, um, but um, 14, 14 of October, uh, South African troops um, were entering in Angola. Uh, they overhanded um, cities like uh, uh, Lobango, then uh, Bengala, Lubitu. So uh, when we arrived in November uh, 1975, Luanda was, was eventually besieged uh, by FNLA, uh, uh, UNITA, and South African troops. Uh, so um, very delicate situa situation. Um, in fact, um, what 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 uh, Soviet think about this? Uh, uh, they were they, they were uh, they were were really really sur surprising about uh, Cuba intervention. So um, uh, was the Soviet Union um, thinking in a in a united Angola, uh, in fact, or uh, maybe? Um, in a, in the country which which could be divided in in, in, in three in three parts between FNLA um, UNITA um, or uh, uh, south controlled by by South Africa and um, a north central um, controlled by N NPLA um, uh, did it did it uh, was if it was uh, think uh, or thought uh, in in Soviet Union in, in, in this in this period, or or not, um, and why and why um, uh, these movements um, so quickly were clashing in Rwanda, uh, because we 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 know we know uh, that. Um, Relationship with uh, between uh, MPLA and FNLA were particularly difficult, uh, but but in 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 the in the end of 1974, um, not so difficult between uh, NPLA and FNLA. Uh, what was the um, the rule of our, of our other countries in this process? Uh, uh, or Thank you, Rui. I think I think the question is clear enough. Uh, yes. If you, if maybe you allow Natalia to try to disentangle it, is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Y okay. Yes. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you much, Rui. Uh, so I think you're asking me basically about kind of two two questions. One about the logistics of the Soviet operation. So. To sum it up very quickly, you know, once uh, the Soviet uh, Soviets decided to resume military assistance to the MPLA at the end of 1974, 
they started mm -hmm. sending weapons by ship, basically, by ship to the port of Pointe Noir in Congo Brazzaville. So starting from early 1975, they sent, I think, I might get, it's, it's in the book, it's all there, but uh, three, three, around three ships they sent over the course of 1975 to Congo Brazzaville. That was quite difficult, you know, because the authorities of Congo Brazzaville for a long time actually uh, blocked the shipments uh, of weapons to the MPLA via Congo Brazzaville. And we can talk a lot about the motivations of regional actors that were really varied because partly because the authorities of Congo Brazzaville supported one of the rival factions, a Revolt Activa, um, actually had to mention. Um, and so the, they had complicated reasons why they would block the shipments. So the Soviet shipments of arms to the MPLA were delayed because Congo Brazzaville was blocking those shipments for quite a few months. And the Soviets are quite keen that Neto resolve his issues, to put it bluntly, resolve his issues with president of Congo Brazzaville, Maria Nogabi, before they could actually go and send ships, right? With, with weapons to the MPLA. Uh, but uh, basically by September, these issues were resolved. So uh, Soviet military assistance could uh, basically go uh, to Congo Brazzaville for the MPLA uninterrupted um, um, as well. So uh, this is kind of the basic of the military operation um, uh, here. Um, as to the Soviet motivations uh, for, um, for Angola, no, there is no evidence to suggest that the Soviets wanted the division of the country into three. They clearly wanted uh, the Angola united including with Kambinda intact there, part of Angola, um, under the leadership of an of a, of a organization which was friendly to them, which initially they thought it could be perhaps MPLA under Chipenda or MPLA under Neto. Eventually it became clear that Chipenda had sided with Zaire, right? He went over kind of and joined FNLA and it was at this point the cut off links to Chipenda. Right. You're right to say that um, they were quite um, friendly with Chipenda initially, right? Um, because actually, I believe the MPLA was not fully representative organization, uh, especially because there were ma many, um, as they called, mystikos in the leadership. So they quite liked the idea of Chipenda and what he represented. But once Chipenda uh, went over, kind of joined, the FNLA, um, I think it was around uh, September, October of 75, they sort of, they, they ended kind of their contacts with, with him. Um, so uh, just to summarize your question, no, there's no evidence to suggest they wanted a divided um, Angola. Uh, and uh, yes, you know, they were providing military support uh, to, to the MPLA starting from uh, January, February uh, of 1975, which included shipments of arms, which included military training. Um, uh, this is, these are two of the main, main things. Um, arms via Point Noir and Congo Brazzaville and military training. Thank you, Natalia. There is a question uh, in the uh, in the chat box. Um, it's about China and the uh, the uh, the involvement of China uh, in the way the question is framed. I'm not uh, exactly sure of the uh, of the uh, of the chronology and the political context, but I suppose that it's both about what you know, if you could tell us anything about uh, the involvement of China both during the colonial wars and then in the process in the revolutionary process and the process of decolonization. Uh, yes, I mean, of course, I mean, there's, there's been, his, uh, you know, excellent historians who studied uh, Sino-Soviet competition in Africa, you know, before me, like the works of Jeremy Friedman, Shadow Cold War, it's an excellent work, which I highly recommend to consult on kind of a broader questions of Sino-Soviet competition. And um, of course, there's, you know, some really good work um, done uh, by, by many Portuguese and Guinea-Bissau scholars, 
um, on, on this issue of uh, Sino-Soviet competition. Uh, um, Joao Soares Sosa has written recently on PAGC and China. Uh, but, of, but very broadly speaking, yes, uh, China's support you know, for, you know, for the FNLA a little bit you need, I know, was a kind of point of concern, but um, at this point um, in 1973, 74, Chinese aid to FNLA wasn't that substantial. Um, they were providing some aid, but it wasn't that dramatic or that substantial. So in this particular case, they were more worried about uh, Zaire and the United States. So yes, of course, uh, you know, when talking about uh, Soviet uh, policy in Africa, we always have to, you know, bear China in mind. China as an important competitor on the left, especially in 1960s, uh, before before kind of the Sino American reapprochement, 1973. But in this particular story, the role of China is a little bit less significant, I would say, than that of what they believed was kind of this international conspiracy which is backed by Zaire and the United States. Yugoslavia, I think there's a question on Yugoslavia as well. I was, I, I was going to say, yes, there's also a question on Yugoslavia by uh, Mauro. Um, so that, so that just to make sure that everyone knows, just wondering if there's anything on the archives on Yugoslavia, did it play any role? Uh, Soviets view on it. And let me just take the, the opportunity to say that Pedro shared the link of um, Shadow Cold War, the book you just mentioned. Everything is happening in the chat. Yes, so yes, of course, um, I myself uh, always try to get uh, kind of the Yugoslav archives. They proved a little bit elusive, but of course um, there's been some good work done and I'm forgetting the names now, but there's been some really, really good work on uh, Yugoslav relations with um, the, uh, with the MPLA, one of it in um, Chris Sondo's uh, recent volume um, as well. So uh, Neto actually had a very close relationship with Joseph Bros Tito uh, of Yugoslavia and Yugoslavia provides substantial support to the MPLA and um, one of uh, the shipments of arms, uh, famously Postoina, who came to Luanda in 1975 was a Yugoslav ship. Uh, but as you know now, there was also a Soviet shipment of Soviet arms. Uh, so yes, the Yugoslavs played a very important role in supporting the MPLA uh, as well. And you know, arguably, when it comes to the earlier period, the Soviets were not not that fascinate. Let's just say they were not that happy about it, especially after uh, Joseph Broz Tito publicly condemned the Soviet intervention in Czechoslovakia, right? So, um, and Neto, nonetheless, despite all of this, Neto went ahead and met Tito. So, apparently, no, not particularly happy about that, but that was for her an earlier period. Uh, but overall, yes, uh, the Yugoslav connection is really important, and Neto clearly preferred the Yugoslavs to the Soviets, uh, partly because of their more non aligned stance. Clearly, the relationship there was uh, close and not as conflictual. And some even argued uh, that kind of the kind of military strategy that he pursued in in Angola in the early 70s was influenced by some of the Yugoslav advisors. But all of this, I'm telling you from this excellent work done by other scholars whose names I just um, I can't recall at the moment. Uh, but if you email me, I will um, I'll send you the links. Thank you very much for that, Natalia. We don't have any questions currently. Um, I don't know if we could just wait another couple of minutes to make sure whether uh, last minute questions pops up. I was, actually, also, I, I was actually going to, to ask you one brief question, returning to the to, to, to the beginning on the role of Albert Cunhal and the uh, 
what you uh, call the um, uh, prioritization of uh, of the role of the of, of, of the Portuguese Communist Party. Can you um, develop a bit that idea and uh, whether the uh, closeness uh, between Cunhal and the, and, the, and the Soviet Union played any, any role in that uh, apparent uh, trust the Soviets have on the um, political action of, of Alvaro Cunhal? Yeah, it seemed that uh, Cunhal, you know, was a highly respected uh, leader in Moscow. Uh, and, you know, he was close, very close to the Soviets. Of course, he had spent much time in, in Moscow himself after his escape from prison. And um, what what I mean here is especially in the first in initial period, what I call, right, of kind of negotiations, early negotiations with the PIGC in Frelimo, uh, the Soviets seem to kind of back the strategy of the Portuguese communists of kind of accommodation of not putting too much pressure on the Portuguese government, because they believed by staying in government, by working kind of within the government, they could um, uh, kind of, they, they were trying to protect uh, the, that position that Cunhal secured within the government, right? Because if you think about it, from the perspective of 1970, 74, 75, it's very rare, right, that a, a communist party, you know, no matter how powerful, I mean, within the government, actually managed to, in, in Western Europe, Western Southern Europe in this case, managed to become part of government right so this is uh this is pretty unique i would say and um they wanted to protect that position they wanted you know they hoped that you know of course um uh, to strengthen their position and they and they believed that they were pushing too hard right on the quick transition the right wing um within within the government and supporters of Spinola and so on, they could um, use the issue of the colonies to organize a counter coup of sorts, right? Which, well, sort of almost happened, right? In kind of August, September. Um, so they, they believed that if you push too much, too strongly uh, kind of on the issue of, of the colonies, this could precipitate kind of a right-wing counter coup. And overall, you know, they kind of follow the advice of the Portuguese Communist Party um, in you know, how the Soviets should behave in relations with the provisional government. And this issue of recognition was particularly contentious, right? Because it went against the tactics pursued by the liberation moments, moments which, you know, which, which said, you know, no recognition un until substantial progress on uh, on independence. So that's what that's what I call a kind of Portuguese centric view in a little bit of, of this process. Okay, and we have another question in the in the chat by Rui, uh, by Rui Jacinto, about uh, the role of uh, the GDR uh, in this process according to uh, Soviet archives. If you have a chance of finding anything. Yeah, I mean, the Soviet archives don't talk about the GDR uh, specifically that much, but um, it's 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 known it's known now. It's been known for some time that the GDR also provided substantial uh, substantial amount of humanitarian aid to the MPLA in 1975. Uh, you know, even more much more than the Soviets did. Uh, so they were you know they were important uh, in the story for sure. But also we know now that the Soviets, once they kind of ramped up, ramped up uh, military assistance to the MPLA, they advised other socialist countries to, well, didn't instruct them, but they communicated very clearly to them that this is what's happening. And, you know, that they kind of gave everybody green light to increase their support to the, to the MPLA as well. So I'm not saying they kind of, uh, uh, they were telling everybody to go then and kind of support the MPLA, but there was communication between Moscow and um, Warsaw, Prague, East Berlin on this issue. And uh, they were also, how I mentioned that there were kind of a string of 
sort of people coming in and out of Landa. So there were there was like Polish ambassadors who were trying to figure out what's going on in in Luanda. There were a few GD, uh, you know members of the G G GDR, you know the um, basically it's German officials coming in and out trying to kind of understand what's going on. There were Soviets, so uh, and all of them. It's it's important to say that nobody knew exactly what is going on, especially in the provinces. So it's, I think, going back to one of your questions, um, I think it was hard for them to fully understand what was going on. I think it was Ricardo, you were saying, you know, how did they evaluate? I think it was difficult for them, especially once the civil war kind of really began to fully evaluate, you know, uh, who, was, uh, who was winning and who was losing because the information they were getting was, was from their own sources, right? And in this case, same Pele. Um, so, uh, so yes, the GDR, um, the GDR played an important role in the story as well. Uh, but um, humanitarian, basically, sending humanitarian aid to the MPLA. Okay, um, thanks a lot, Natalia. That was really interesting. Um, it was a great session of our seminar. I, I hope you return. Um, to our sessions. I don't think, I, I'm not sure if uh, Rita, Pedro or Ricardo want to, to add anything. Um, uh, this, uh, we, we'll, we still have a, a, a last session before the summer. Uh, so just uh, to inform you that on the, uh, the 15th of July, uh, always on a Thursday, uh, we're going to have Ricardo Noronha. And, and the title of his presentation will be The Political Economy of the Carnation Revolution world system analysis. I'm actually not sure whether Ricardo is going to speak in English or in Portuguese. Um, it should be in English. Uh, it should unless, be in English, yeah, okay, great. I will write it in and, English. Okay, great. And hopefully by then we'll also have the program for next uh, autumn. So we are now preparing the four sessions for the autumn. And this is the the, the rhythm that, uh, that the seminar is going to follow. We are always going to prepare four sessions for the next uh, season. Uh, so hopefully in the, in the, on, on the 15th of July, we'll, all, we'll all already have the four names and the four titles for the sessions of uh, September, October, November, and December. Again, thanks a lot, Natalia. It was great seeing you again and uh, um, following up your uh, most recent research. Thank you, thank you for sharing that with us and uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you for inviting. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh